Have you ever heard an anti-gunner say something like, this second amendment doesn't apply to an AR-15 because the people back in old timey land could never have conceived of a gun that could shoot more than one round without reloading. It only applies to muskets. I've heard it and I've heard it plenty of times. This argument is based on ignorance and probably willful ignorance given how much information is just a computer search away. Still, what leftist wants to deal with facts when they don't support their buttercup feelings? Stick with me as we do a little bit of time traveling and delve into the history of repeating firearms, their origins, why they were so rare, and how, when, and why they became more accessible. Since the left seems obsessed with the Founding Fathers' lack of perspective around the time, let's start with a period just before 1791 when the Second Amendment was ratified. There is an abundance of documentation and patents and preserved letters to and from Congress. I want to thank Blackout Coffee Company for sponsoring this video. Blackout is a small batch coffee roaster in sunny Florida that has supported the channel for a long time and has supported the Second Amendment for even longer. They have super smooth coffees, great teas, and delicious hot chocolate, and profits from their partner roasts go directly to some of your favorite gun rights groups. So it is a win-win situation. To check them out, support the channel and the Second Amendment, go to blackoutcoffee.com slash libertydoll. Several of those letters were from Joseph Belton, an inventor from Philadelphia, and made their way to Congress. The first was dated April 11th, 1777, and can be found in the Continental Congress online archives. In them, he extolled the virtue of his repeating flintlock that could fire eight shots in under three seconds before needing to be reloaded. Intrigued, Congress ordered 100 prototypes for testing and evaluation. Belton requested additional funds and time, as making each by hand was pretty time-consuming and quite costly. After several letters back and forth, the concept was passed on to the War Department, where it was determined to just be too costly to arm an entire platoon, let alone a whole company, with the Belton repeating rifle. But they did encourage him to continue development in an attempt to get the cost down. Now, despite the fact that Belton failed to convince the Continental Congress to outfit colonial soldiers with his repeating rifle, it is still an important story. Belton invented his repeating gun in 1777. The Bill of Rights was ratified in 1791. Now, math is not my strongest subject, but even I know that our founding fathers not only knew about the repeating rifle at least 14 years before the creation of the Second Amendment, but they thought highly enough of it to pursue further development. And that's kind of a big deal. If you think that Belton's rifle was all that was available at the time, well, you, my friend, are wildly mistaken. Documents and news reports from September 1722 tell of a man named John Pym of Boston who was showing off for some local Indians. He reportedly demonstrated a repeating flintlock that could fire 11 shots in less than two minutes and could penetrate a double door at 50 yards. Now, admittedly, not a lot by today's standards, but when you consider that the average person of the time could only load and fire a single shot from a flintlock in about 30 seconds to a minute, I get a little bit more impressed by those figures. Now, Pym also owned a six-shot 52 caliber flintlock revolver. It was similar to ones made in England since around the early 1700s. His repeating rifle was also probably another English rifle from around the same period. He had most likely just modified it as no records seem to show he was actually an inventor and he also had that English pistol. But even those weren't all there was. Several museums have a variety of two to four shot pistols that have been preserved from around the 18th century. Another example of the time was a little bit of an oddball, and that is the Ghirardoni air rifle. And yes, I did say air rifle. It was invented in 1779 for Austrian sharpshooters. It could fire 21 or 22 bullets in either 46 or 49 caliber without reloading. Lewis and Clark carried at least one on their expedition during the Jefferson administration. It was used for defense as well as hunting and could reliably take down an elk. These examples are just what was going on in America around that time. Worldwide, repeating firearms had been in play for years, like centuries kind of years. 
The earliest known repeater that I could find information about was a breech loading match lock from around 1490 to 1530. It had a 10 shot revolving cylinder. Additionally, Henry VIII reportedly had a long gun with a wheel lock that held 16 rounds and it dated back to around 1580. And these were not just one-off lucky inventions. Production continued into the 17th century. There was a four-barreled wheel lock pistol that could fire 15 shots in just a few seconds. And no, it was not a 30 caliber banana clip magazine in half a second. This right here has ability with a 30 caliber clip to disperse with 30 bullets within half a second. 30 magazine clip in half a second. The English had a breech loading lever action repeater and a revolver. Both were made by an English gunmaker around the time of the English Civil War. Yet another British repeating gun made in 1718 was made to combat pirate boarding parties and is probably the most famous. It was called the Puckle Gun. It had a revolving cylinder and could fire nine shots in under a minute. But the English hadn't cornered the market. In fact, the first large-scale production was in 1646, and it was by the Danish. Yeah, who saw that coming? I had to double and triple check my facts on that one. But apparently the Danish could really kick some butt back in the day. They invented a flintlock that used a pair of tubular magazines and could fire a whopping 30 shots without reloading. Do not let the senators from California hear about that one. The mechanism was made ready by a two-step motion of the trigger guard, not entirely unlike a modern lever-action rifle. They were produced for the Danish and the Dutch armies for several years. And now you might be asking, well, with all of these repeating firearms from around the world, why weren't they more readily available and in the hands of every colonial and explorer? And that, my friends, has a simple answer. Each and every one had to be handmade and the parts had to be hand fitted together. This made the repeating rifles and pistols extremely expensive and time consuming to make. But that doesn't mean they didn't want to. So remember how I said that Congress was impressed but just couldn't afford to buy enough to field an effective company or more of soldiers? Now we time travel to just a few years after the ratification of the Bill of Rights. Now President James Madison from 1809 to 1817 is in office and he and James Monroe, his Secretary of State, are promoting legislation to foster and standardize firearms technology. See, James Madison was one of the authors of the Second Amendment, and he had been very interested in Joseph Belton's rifle, but also very frustrated with the long production time and high cost. The legislation that Madison and Monroe pushed through started a firearms revolution of sorts. They insisted on firearms having standardized and interchangeable parts. This led to companies opening up in Springfield, Massachusetts and Harpers Ferry, Virginia. Those companies pioneered research that led to water-driven machine presses and other manufacturing devices that greatly increased production and, at the same time, decreased production costs. While repeating firearms would remain too complex for anything but handcrafting for a few years to come, the idea that this country's forefathers were oblivious to the idea of repeating firearms is just idiotic. A few hours of research uncovered more verifiable information on this topic that can be covered in a full semester at your local college. These examples were just the tip of the iceberg. So the next time some lefty suggests something about the Second Amendment not covering ARs or AKs, just refer them to this video. Or if you're feeling extra spicy, rattle off this quote from a Supreme Court justice in the Heller decision. We do not limit our constitutional rights to the technology that existed in 1791. Some have made the argument, bordering on the frivolous, that only the arms in existence in the 18th century are protected by the Second Amendment. We do not interpret constitutional rights this way. Just as the First Amendment protects modern forms of communication, e.g. Reno v. American Civil Liberties Union, 1997, and the Fourth Amendment applies to modern forms of search, e.g. Kylo v. United States, 2001. The Second Amendment extends to all instruments that constitute bearable arms, even those that were not in existence at the time of the founding of this country. This is an accurate statement of constitutional law, but it understands how truly frivolous the argument against modern firearms is. 
the people who ratified the Bill of Rights certainly did not anticipate the invention centuries later of the internet or of thermal imaging sensors. But the American people of 1791 didn't have to anticipate the invention of repeating arms because such arms had been in existence already for centuries. No one would dispute that modern arms are much improved from 1791 in terms of reliability, accuracy, range, and affordability. But the gap from the 22 shot Ghiridoni, again, powerful enough to take down an elk, to a modern firearm is pretty small compared with the changes in technology of the press. Compared to the one-sheet-at-a-time printing presses of 1791, the steam and rotary presses invented in the 19th century made printing vastly faster, a speed improvement that dwarfs the speed improvement in firearms in the last 500 years. When the First Amendment was written, a skilled printer could produce 250 sheets in about two hours. Today, a modern newspaper printing press can produce 70,000 copies of a newspaper consisting of dozens of sheets in an hour. And even now, those are on the way out because with digital publishing, a newspaper article can be read globally within minutes after it is written. But as stated in Heller, we are not limiting our First Amendment to those old printing presses, and the same can be said for the second. That is it for this little history lesson. If you liked this video and would like to see more videos on the history of the Second Amendment, as well as current Second Amendment news, please subscribe to this channel if you haven't already. Like this video, share it, and drop a comment down below for the algorithm. I hope you learned a thing or two or ten, and as always, Thanks for tuning in and happy shooting.